Well, Charles, thank you for that uh, far too kind um, introduction. He's actually been kind because he knows that if he'd been even the wrong side of things, then we would have had to discuss my uh, the long and uh, fruitful relationship with Charles about, uh, and I've had from the days when we both had hair, actually. <laughs> uh, most of the hair, by the way, was here rather than there. Uh, if you've seen our, our photographs. Uh, it's worth saying that um, uh, during that, the reason I would always say yes to uh, an invitation from Charles is that um, in spite of every successful effort he's made to present himself as this dreadful bruiser, and no, no, I have no doubt that he's mostly rude to most of you, he's extremely, ex always been an extremely supportive and kind person to whom I've always turned, um, actually at most junctures in my career, thinking what should I do about this, what should I do about this, uh, I've almost always turned to Charles, and the conversation has always gone something like this. Uh, you know, I, um, they, I've had a little bit of, you know, leaning on to get into this London Mayor thing, or Dave Blunkett's been on and said, but I put my name in for the Commission for Equality, or they want to set up this new commission, and, you know, I, I want to go back to television, but, they're, you know, what do you think? I really sort of, I don't want to, but I really feel maybe there's some obligation. And my, what I'm asking, Charles, is can you just help me by saying, no, I don't, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what Charles then says is, well, actually, you shouldn't do it, but you're going to, aren't you? <laughs> so, to which the answer, you, in all, the, all of those occasions, is yes. And it's then followed by Charles, you know it's going to be a disaster, don't you? <laughs> and he's saying, how dare you? <laughs> Two years later, you know what you said? It was just... Uh... Anyway, I'm really grateful to you for uh, joining us this evening. I hope that we'll have an interesting conversation. I'm uh, keen to hear what you have to say about um, some of the points I'd like to make. I'm really impressed that you did get here. I'm not an alumnus of this university. Uh, though I do know it a little bit, and it's a pleasure to be back here after 30 years, when, 35 years actually, when I was last here, I uh, believe it was to encourage students to occupy some crucial campus building. <laughs> and I, 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 I'm re I was saying to Charles, I, rec I, I recognised the geography. I, I knew straight away that there were new buildings at the front, because if, we, if they'd been there at the time, I probably would have chosen those to occupy, because they're nice. Um, but, uh, of course, not the sort of thing I'd encourage now because I'm a responsible member of society. Um, this university has a phenomenal reputation in the creative industries, including TV and film. There are people associated with it uh, who I admire, my great friend Valerie Amos, and, of course, uh, the students here and the staff were, were smart enough to elect Charles for many years. Um, but of course, the, my real memory of the campus is the occupation, and I have to say, UEA's approach to revolution actually suited my temperament. Uh, less a political act and more a three-week carnival. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here, sharing the platform with the former NUS president, home university of one of our successors, who coincidentally was called Vicky Phillips. And if any of you were actually students here in our period, you uh, will reach further back and remember that there was a student union president here actually called Trevor Phillips, uh, who I think actually lives in the air and spends most of his time explaining that he's not me and whatever I said I did was not his fault. Now, Charlton Hussain suggested that I should offer some reflections after my 10 years at the uh, CRE and the HRC uh, as a leader of the so-called equality industry, as the Daily Mail would have it as the high priest of political correctness, as the, Sun, as the Sunday Express would have it. Now, I'm happy to do that in passing and maybe in some of the questions, but I thought, as I thought about what I should say to you tonight, I realise that there's, frankly, a rather more interesting agenda to discuss than what I've done or we've done to try to meet the challenge of human difference during the past half century, fascinating as that might be for me to do, to tell you some more stories. 
But to my mind, the more important and intriguing, intriguing agenda is what we're going to do to cope with that challenge in the next 50 years. And I don't think it, that it's an exaggeration to suggest that it will be the hardest problem that we and the generation that is on this campus will face. In the 21st century, the human species will face two overarching questions. First, how do we live with our planet? And the second is, how do we live with each other? I have absolutely no doubt that of the two dilemmas, the second is the less tractable. It is also the more urgent. And I want to start by making it clear that I'm not tonight um, that interested in addressing the issues that arise from what you might call individual psychology, how individual people feel about other people. That, though it's important, is largely not the business of public policy, except perhaps where action by the state or the community might reduce stress in the workplace, for example. And that uh, would have some impact on the issues of mental illness. But I think what public policy should concern itself with is the effect of relations between categories of people defined by characteristics that are inherent and which lie largely outside the choice of the individual. Gender, race, uh, age, for example. And for shorthand, I'm going to be calling these identity characteristics. Now, whether attributes such as sexual orientation or religion fall into this category is contested by some people. But for most purposes, I think they are so integral to the identity of most individuals that for a practical discussion, they are no different uh, from those I've mentioned before. The central point about all of these characteristics is that they have three uh, factors. First of all, they are what you would describe as discoverable. That is to say, they're either self-evident, they're obvious, or in some cases, they can be made self-evident or plain to others, even if we don't want them to be revealed, our sexual orientation, for example. And in any event, that the characteristic objectively can be defined. Secondly, they're largely fixed for each individual. There's little that we can do about these particular characteristics without some extreme interventions. And once I recognize, for example, that there are people who want or require gender reassignment, uh, for the most part, people don't want to have to change those characteristics anymore. And thirdly, and this is a critical point, they are shared with a substantial number of others, creating a category of people. And it's why, by the way, and this is a serious point because it is, has been discussed seriously uh, when we were uh, drafting the Equality Act of 2010, this came up again and again, but it is why, in my view, adding weight, for example, discrimination on the grounds of fatness, or, or what some people call facial discrimination, ugliness, to the grounds in equality legislation would have been a terrible mistake. Except where these things occur as a consequence of, let's say, clinical obesity, or of disfigurement, uh, which would in any uh, situation pretty much be covered by disability status. These other characteristics would not meet my three requirements. It's also why, more importantly, tonight I'm not going to be talking about socioeconomic status as part of this group of categories. Now, this is a continuing argument about people who worry about anti-discrimination and inequality. To what extent is our social and economic origins alike uh, or like these other characteristics? Well, here's my view about it. We are pretty good in this country at deciding about people based on their clothes or the way they speak. As George Bernard Shaw uh, said in the introduction to Pygmalion, it's impossible for an Englishman to open his mouth without making some other Englishman hate or despise him. <laughs> But our prejudices are not infallible guides. I'm, for example, the son of a man who spent most of his life in uniform, as a soldier, as a railway man, as a postman. My mother worked for decades in a sweatshop, sewing furs. 
I was born into a Rackham and slum in inner London. But I speak, I guess, like pretty much every other southern middle class professional. So that that history is not where you would, if you didn't know me, automatically place me. The point about the lines of class is that they are blurred and they are more or less permeable. And though we can argue till the cows come home about quite how easy it is to move across those lines, I think that they, those facts make them unlike the other categories I've been talking about. So for tonight's purposes, I'm not including this particular social dimension in my too difficult box. You might then say, well, what's left isn't a particularly interesting box to open. We already know what's in it. The task of preventing discrimination and encouraging equality of opportunity. And in this country, we've spent the past half century worrying away at it. And we're pretty good at it, in my view. The box contains the problems associated with a society coming to terms with human difference and struggling to ensure that different need not mean unequal. Indeed, we could call this box different yet equal. Well, over the past uh, two and a half centuries, we have been in the West extraordinarily successful at prosecuting this cause. Sometimes to hear people talk, you would think nothing had changed since the Middle Ages. But for children today, the defining political struggles, the Second World War, civil rights, the defeat of apartheid, for example, are actually all about equality before the law. Eliminating unjust discrimination, the flourishing of the oppressed as equal citizens. And even if we don't know where the words come from, the, declar the one declaration resonates across the globe. The words are that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain un unalienable rights. The fact that they were written by a slave owner, Thomas Jefferson, for the benefit largely of other slave owners, still doesn't diminish their power. Uh, these words are what we see when we open this particular too difficult box. But what I want to do tonight is not to dwell too much on that, but to delve a little further into this box. And the reason is that I think that this box has a false bottom. And in that false bottom lie, lies a series of issues which many of us know are there, but we would really rather prefer to keep from the light. In this secret compartment, there's a creature which I think is stirring restlessly because it's been, it thinks it's been shut out of the light too long. It suspects that the preeminence of Jefferson's dictum in our world is crushing it. And even for those of us politically on the left whose cause has been equality, there's a court case to answer here. There's something to think about. Something that has, for the better part of the 20th century, been ignored pretty deliberately by progressive opinion. Because we hoped that with the advance of equality, social divisions based on race, religion, even gender perhaps, would simply wither away. Well, I'll examine for a moment how successful, or I'll examine in a moment, how successful that was, particularly with reference to the former Soviet Empire. But let me start by thinking about how we would describe this <coughs> compartment. It doesn't have a Jeffersonian er uh, text yet, but for the moment, let me try the words of a modern day prophet on you. This person said, if man is to survive, he will have learned to take a delight in the essential differences between men and between cultures. He will learn that differences in ideas and attitudes are a delight part of life's exciting variety, not something to fear. Who is this guru? Well, his name is Gene Roddenberry, and the literary amongst you will know that he was the creator of Star Trek. <laughs> now, before you dismiss his wisdom, let me remind you 
that uh, he said this in the 1960s when to most men of his type and age, women were an alien species. Uh, but he was also the man who put the first interracial kiss, Kirk and Uhuru, for those of you who know about these things on TV, who pioneered characters whose sexuality was indeterminate and did so deliberately, and whose entire work championed the idea of a world or a universe in which very different peoples could find a way of living together without tyranny. tyranny. But as Argon set out, though Captain Kirk and his crew might give us a conceptual star to steer by, right now, when it comes to navigating our path towards a world in which we manage difference without conflict, I think we're spinning out of control, as uh, they might say on Star Trek, through a singularity into an unknown galaxy. And I fear for this moment we just don't have a Spock to set out rational options, we don't have a Sulu to pilot our way through the chaos, and no Kirk to decide the course. If the top half of our box is labelled different yet equal, we might want to consider labelling our secret unopened compartment equal yet different. How can we let diversity flourish without undermining the drive towards equality of opportunity? I want to start uh, this part of what I want to say by explaining why I want to open this particular box. And the reasons are personal and professional and political. Uh, the obvious reason is that, as you've heard, it's been part of my political and professional life for the past 30 years or so, most recently, and most obviously as chair of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. But before I turn to that, let me say something about my own family. Uh, I was, in fact, born in London, but circumstances were such that my parents thought it better, me, better to send me back to Guyana, where I went as a baby. Uh, it was a country that they still called Hull in those days, 1950, in that, uh, that would be 1955 when I went. So as a child, as a teenager, I actually was lucky to enjoy the privilege of living in one of the most diverse countries in the world. Because in those days, uh, the capital of Georgetown was a little garden city with its back to the Atlantic, its face to the cane fields, the river scape, and a virgin rainforest that led water uh, Raleigh to christen it El Dorado. The people of Guyana were and are as diverse as you can imagine. Europeans, Asians, Arabs, Africans, Native Americans. And in fact, the only people I thought, I think I'd never met as a teenager, were Australian Aborigines. On the other hand, uh, I have to point out though, as a teenager, there was no TV, no fancy restaurants that I knew about, and one major library in a city of 200,000 people. But as in most Commonwealth nations, we had the experience of living with a cultural, ethnic and racial mix that was probably, had probably not been paralleled since the days of the Roman Imperium. And you could regard this as a prototype for today's huge movement of people across the globe in search of work. The old British Empire functioned in part as a vast labour market machine ensuring that skills and labour shortages were responded to quickly and efficiently. And as a direct result of the Empire's policy of moving migrant workers across the globe to fill labour needs, skilled Scot and Welsh engineers turned up in Canada and India, Indian labourers had sailed to Africa and the Caribbean, Chinese farm workers were shipped in just about everywhere. Uh, by the way, that's why Trevor McDonald's called McDonald, Moira Stewart is called Moira Stewart, I am called Phillips, which is uh, the name of anybody that you, if you throw a stone in mid Wales, you're going to hit somebody called Phillips. <laughs> My old classmates from Guyana showed names like Ali, Ishmael, Persaud, uh, Chan, Ming, Tenpao Singh, as well as conventional European names like Adams, Harris, Allen, Moore, Phillips. But as in so much of the Commonwealth, behind the racial and religious rainbow, there lay a bitter and often violent history of ethnic feuding, which still disfigures that country. One of my own classmates and friends, uh, whose name is Donald Rodney, in later years saw his brother, a writer and academic, murdered, largely for espousing the cause of non-racial politics. 
Today, Guyana remains one of the poorest nations in the world, stricken by racial and ethnic divisions, unable to re realize its considerable natural resources. Uh, so I've lived with the first hand, with the, and seen first hand, the tantalizing possibilities of great diversity, energy, innovation, so on. But the, I've also seen the ghastly reality, the consequences of the absence of a toleration and uh, integration. Now that's a very personal reason for addressing this. But there are, all, there are also, as I said, the obvious professional reasons. I've been opening the top half of the box pretty regularly for 40 years as a student activist, as a journalist, and in politics. There are things in this box, by the way, um, the professional box, that, I'd be, that I'm happy not to have to revisit, having stepped down from the EHRC. I'm happy not to have to explain, to explain every single year to the Daily Mail that the Equality Act does not outlaw Christmas, and that yes, it's okay to mention the baby Jesus in the school's Yuletide carol concert. I am happy not to have to sit through foreign office briefings in con uh, or conferences uh, studied with such gems as, and the Tanzanians, they are really the nigger in the woodpile. Though, uh, I haven't heard anybody say that for at least a couple of years. Uh, I particularly look forward to never again having to receive the Kazakh ambassador. Um, this is one of my favourite moments as chair of the Court and Human Rights Commission. After the release of um, Sasha Baron Cohen's second movie, uh, the ambassador turned up virtually in tears of rage. And he demanded that I personally lock up Borat for <laughs> insulting the Kazakh people. The fact that he seemed a rather sincere man made what followed rather more difficult. Because first I had to explain the British idea of a joke. <laughs> then I had to explain that nobody here actually does get locked up for laughing at somebody else. Um, now this took at least 90 minutes and by that point he got fed up and he left with his... He had an entourage of about 10 guys. Um, but I, I actually wasn't looking forward to explaining that Whatever I thought, he, he persuaded me, it wouldn't matter how many Kazakh artifacts he gave me or how many small brown envelopes he put on the table. I just didn't have the power to put Baron, Sati Baranko behind bars. But um, I learned some things in that post that are important to me. Today we're focusing on the word equality. But actually we're talking about a rather profound question that faces virtually every society in the world. The problem of what uh, Isaiah Berlin called living together graciously. Now, I like Isaiah Berlin's formulation because tolerance has incorrectly, and I think sadly, come to imply in English, uh, though not so in French, a grudging coexistence between people who barely know each other and who, frankly, are happy that it should stay that way. In fact, the original Elizabethan idea of toleration was a more active proposition, a rather dynamic convergence of cultures and traditions to create a new kind of Englishness. I do, by the way, um, know about Walsingham's use of torture and the cruelty of the police state he created, but even so, I do think that we could well follow the Elizabethan template without the thumb screws, of course. Um, in modern diverse societies, there are more lines of cleavage than there ever have been before. There are more legitimate aspirations for the recognition of different kinds of identity than ever before. And there are more claims for the protection of identity-based rights than in any previous polity. A generous and curious and creative toleration could be the thing that makes a difference between, on the one hand, a world which builds on the foundation stones of globalization and technological change, and on the other, a world which is buried by those foundation stones in an avalanche of ethnic conflict and rampant inequality, societies which are vociferous and tribal. Now, the dilemma and solving it that I've described lies at the heart of Berlin's quest for what you might call a generous toleration. And I want to argue tonight that solving this problem 
is now more important than it ever has been. And despite the fact that we here in the UK probably have more to celebrate in this respect than almost anyone else in the world, there's still much to work out and much to do before we can feel content that we've got it licked. Now, in emphasizing the concept of graciousness, that is to say, living together with trust, generosity of spirit, without contractual obligation, Berlin suggested that at least some aspect of the task of building a society at ease with its diversity would lie beyond the reach of the law and outside the purview of government and politics. In short, we would one day reach the point where we would not, by statutory means, be able to compel <coughs> mutual respect or good behaviour towards other people. And it's my contention that we're fast approaching that point. So my third set of reasons for wanting to open the box are political. Frankly, I don't want to see the box that is marked equal but different appropriated to the cause of the right under the false banner of individual liberty and freedom of expression. These are, in fact, universal values. But it seems to me that liberals and progressives like myself have been in danger of surrendering them by sheer neglect because of our focused pursuit of equality. In the past 50 years, I think we've worked out what to do to make our societies different but equal. But the collapse of communism in the late 1980s should have given those of us on the progressive side of politics a warning. The Soviet Union, in spite of our cynicism about its corruption and dominance of party officials, was a society in which most people were at least equally miserable. 1989 gave freedom to many people to be pressed into a kind of grey uniformity by Soviet imperialism, and we rightly welcomed their freedom. But that freedom also unleashed bigotries and hatreds that had been suppressed for over 70 years by totalitarianism. And we know where that's led us, mostly to the war crimes tribunals in The Hague. And by the way, I am including in my analysis not just the Balkans, but also the client states in Africa and Asia, devastatingly the Middle East. And by the way, remember Cambodia's year zero all aspects of the same historical shift. My point is that all of these societies sincerely believe that if they could make people equal, they would expunge any need for them to express their differences, uh, whether tribal, religious, or cultural. That didn't work, and we're paying the price now. That's a global reason for worrying about how we reconcile equality with diversity. But here at home, there are two further reasons that make the management of identity relations such an important challenge today. First, there's a series of objective reasons. I am going to take two examples. The most pressing was explained earlier in this series when Charles Clark pointed out that global migration was taking place on an unprecedented scale. According to the International Migration Organization, there are over 200 million people who live and work in a different country from the one in which they were born. Add to that the much larger number of individuals who may not have moved across international borders, but who have moved to another region in the same country where culture, language, religion, and the dominant ethnicity are not the same as their own. The fact is that there are more people meeting and living alongside people who do not share their identity than at any time in human history. And to borrow a geological metaphor, the frictional energy generated by such massive movements is huge and potentially destructive. To give you an example of the idea and scale and disruptiveness of such movements, I'd like to consider somewhere we don't think about yet very much, the people's, in this respect, the People's Republic of China. Internal movements there are governed by the Hukou system or household registration system a kind of internal immigration control regime. The number of licenses officially issued allowing people to move and find work inside China, usually from rural to urban areas, may now be about 100 million. But experts believe that unofficially there may be a further 230 million internal migrants. 
together over 300 million people, nearly the size of the population of Western Europe. It is now the source of what some in China describe as a new apartheid. The brutality and divisiveness of this system was dramatized earlier this month when it reported in the South China Morning Post that the victims of an expressway collapse in Henan province would be awarded compensation of many tens of thousands of dollars, but that migrant workers with a rural hukou registration would be awarded the equivalent of $35,000 less than their urban counterparts. In effect, the cost of a migrant's death would be less than that of a city dweller's. The episode, I think, lays pretty brutally clear uh, the value that China puts on a migrant's life, whatever the actuari actuarial calculations, uh, however the actuarial calculations might try to obfuscate it. It's hardly surprising, then, that uh, one of the most, the largest delegation I received in my time as chair of the EHRC was from the city of Shanghai's local government. And they were seeking advice on how to deal with growing conflict between settled and migrant workers, urban and rural. The year before that, my equivalent on the Central Committee of the Communist Party, who uh, bears the responsibility for nationalities and minorities, told me that he was struggling to work out how to manage relations between the hundreds of millions of people in the 150 or so uh, ethnic groups in China. And he asked my advice. Uh, I have to say that um, the best advice I could come up with was, uh, in effect, good luck with that, mate. <laughs> a second objective change that's created a new identity crisis is the status of women in Western countries. We all know that probably the single most transformative technological change in the 20th century was the development of cheap and reliable birth control, another unprecedented step in human history. But right behind the pill in significance comes the humble washing machine. In David Willett's book about intergenerational inequality, he reports that between 1974 and 2004, women in Britain acquired over two hours free time each day, previously allocated to household tasks such as washing clothes. Now, um, our grandmothers would intuitively understand what this is about. The expression wash day has passed out of common usage uh, for the reasons I've just given. But for them, wash day was literally that, an entire day of their lives every week or more devoted to soaking, scrubbing, rinsing, hanging out the clothes. Now, women might have used this free time uh, for any purpose. Education, sports, watching the sun come up and go down. Well, what they have done, in fact, and this is probably the effect of feminist politics, is to devote about 80% of that extra time to paid work outside the home. And that marked the single largest contribut contribut uh, con contribution to household income and, of course, to the transformation of the British workplace. For the first time, women are real competitors in the labour market. And that's perhaps best symbolised by the fact that today there is very little difference in pay and status between men and women up to the age of 30. At which point, of course, children torpedo many women's careers for a decade or so, and they never recover. There is still a significant gender pay gap, but it is not now primarily the result of direct discrimination, but a combination of job segregation and a choice, an issue to which I'll return a little later. So much for objective real-world change. Alongside the pressures caused by technology and economics, there are social and cultural changes, particularly in affluent societies like ours. In a society where no one's starving, uh, choices about how we live our lives and how we express our identities become easier. That's the point of affluence. It gives you choice. Each of us is a composite of many things, our family histories, our professions, our gender, our race, and so on. And as we become more affluent, more secure, we want to live lives that are more in tune with all of the aspects of our identities. And we want everyone to know who and what we are. 
That is what gay pride, disability rights, and the Black, and Black is Beautiful movement were all about. But this is not just about how we feel. It's also about how others regard us. For many years, I commissioned what I privately called the Work, Rest and Play Survey. In it, we asked a representative sample of British people each year how they would feel about having, for example, a female boss, gay neighbours, or a black or Asian in-law. Twenty years ago, more than a quarter of British people would express some unease, and that meant that actually there were many more who just didn't want to say. And they usually uh, explained it by saying that they themselves had no worries, but they thought there might be problems for their fellow workers, uh, or that the neighbours, the other neighbours, would be anxious, or they had relatives who were not quite as open-minded as they were. Interpret for yourself. Now, today, you will struggle to find one in ten people admitting to those attitudes. And amongst people under 30, I suspect that the questions we would have used in the 1980s would actually seem incomprehensible. They would not understand what you were asking them. The Olympics last summer simply confirmed what we have been measuring for some time, that there has been an enormous sea change in British attitudes towards diversity. In, e in essence, well-off societies like ours are enjoying more freedoms and more public differentiation of identity. But with that public freedom comes the likelihood of more contestation over, for example, what should be the dominant social norms in the society. What do I mean by that in practice? Well, put it this way. When LGB people were in the closet, there was never going to be a risk of a dispute over the meaning of marriage. Nobody had to discuss that. When black sportsmen swallowed racial taunts in silence, there would have never have been any need to consider how to punish the offenders, whether they were on the pitch or on the terraces. Today, all of that has changed, and we're rightly daily confronted with the fallout from the exposure of our differences. But the problem, actually, isn't the fact of difference. It is the manner in which we meet it, confront it, and negotiate it. The second subjective point I want to uh, talk about is the fact that we now know a great deal more about the effect of belonging to an identity uh, category uh, than we used to. Uh, the question of how we manage relations across the many lines of identity difference is, we know, becoming more crucial. But we now know that the challenge is rather different to the one uh, that we had in the last 50 years. First, because individual attitudes are so much more tolerant and so much less prejudiced, uh, we have to, we are facing uh, a different sort uh, of disadvantage. It doesn't mean, by the way, that the spirit of Bernard Manning has died, but I would say that it has retired and is ha hopefully breathing its last somewhere on the less salubrious coast of southern Spain. But we know a great deal more, as I said, about the effect of belonging to identity categories, and we know that some differences are inherent, we know that, generally speaking, some differences of behaviour, of achievement, performance, are in inextricably associated with race, gender, and so forth. At the very simplest, I can father a child, but I'm never going to carry one. Several members of my family, including me, carry the gene for sickle cell anemia, but my partner, whose family is of Irish descent, doesn't. This is a reality that the health service has to find its way around. But my main point here is that even in a world where tolerance abounds, equality is legally enforced, we are more open about our identities, we are never simply going to be reduced to individuals, defined without reference to groups of people who share some of our attributes. That is why the identity issue is so important. But what it perhaps is more important is not what group we think we belong to, but what group others place us in, and what that then leads them 
to think about us and how they then treat us. It is now a fact, a commonplace of behavioural science, that when we meet someone new, the first thing we note about them, before clothes, before grooming, before speech and so forth, is their race, their colour. That's simply an observation. It's not a judgment. Unless the ident identification of the race also locks us into a category with a narrative in the mind of the person we've met. The fact is, even in these enlightened times, in this enlightened nation, we can find ourselves reduced by other people to being just a category defined by race, gender, or some kind of disability. And let me give you an example. We dealt with the recent a case in which Pizza Hut had given their managers discretion to deal with the problem of people coming into the restaurant, eating, and running off without paying. I don't imagine anybody in here would ever do that anymore, um, but you can imagine how it works. Managers were allowed to ask some customers to pay up front. Perfectly reasonable policy. But it doesn't take a huge amount of imagination to work out what then happened. Black customers were disproportionately asked to pay up front, whilst some white customers were not. Now, in one branch on the south coast, four young men noticed that while they'd been asked to pay up front, their neighbours weren't. The former group were black, the latter white. But actually, that was not the thing that really separated them. Bizarrely, the case involved four black professional footballers who probably could have bought the whole restaurant <laughs> with the wages from one afternoon's uh, work. But in this particular moment, they were not seen as wealthy young men with a, pen a penchant for cheap Italian food. For that moment, they were defined by their colour and only their colour. They were black young men with a narrative that said they're looking, they've got an eye for the all-you-can-eat buffet and the route to the nearest exit. You might call this kind of thing uh, the identity well. That is to say, a situation in which one characteristic is so dominant in everyone else's mind that it obliterates everything else about you. That it is, and it's their reaction to that one characteristic that imprisoned you in the well of your part identity. Now, often we're plunged into this identity well not just because of some positive policy, <coughs> but simply by thoughtlessness. Uh, an issue that arises frequently for disabled people. When I first took the job of chair of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, I went to dinner with a colleague who is a wheelchair user. We rolled up to the door of the restaurant, we were thanking our lucky stars because we got there just as it started to rain, and then we found that the place didn't have a wheelchair access and the ramp, when they eventually located it, didn't fit the step. So off we went, tried another restaurant, same problem. And by the third rain-sodden, miserable and angry attempt, we did in fact find somewhere that managed to get us in. But my point here is this. My colleague could have been black, white, male, transsexual. He could have been as rich as Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg. As it happened, he was pretty well known. He just got his knighthood for services to disabled people. But on that evening, at that moment, he was just another bloke in a wheelchair in the rain. Nothing else mattered about him. So historically, the identity world trap has damaged, imprisoned entire groups of people. And by the way, even assumptions made with the best of intentions can land us in those worlds. My older brother uh, was told by a well-meaning teacher at his son's school that it would be mentally helpful to make sure that there were books in the house. Uh, as he knew that many black children, he'd studied, you know, he knew all that multiculturalism, um, and he knew that many black children were underachieving because they came from poor households, where there weren't books, where the parents had not themselves been to university. At the time that this conversation took place, my brother was a senior lecturer at Westminster University. His partner was also a lecturer, and between them, they'd written half a dozen books themselves. <laughs> the problem with all of this is that we know that there are real limits to dealing with these issues, which are practical, 
and philosophical. philosophical. And there are serious limits on the extent to which we can use the law to protect people from being dropped into that identity well. There are areas, equal pay for example, where the numbers of individual complaints are so great that it's inconceivable that all of the complainants could reasonably be offered remedies by the tribunal system, which by the way is pretty near collapse. We'd end up with some victories, but not much justice. We can't put diversity police into every business or every school. Ultimately, the puzzle of the secret compartment in our too difficult box is how we change human behavior without state compulsion. I want to end by briefly sketching out three areas that I think we should be exploring to try to solve that problem. First, issues of culture and manners. How do we change people's reflexes? How do we influence the way we speak and relate to each other? Historically in this country, we've relied on a class-based set of rules. In the past, those rules didn't need to be written down or even properly articulated. They were passed from parent to child. But returning, for example, to the issue of immigrant integration, for newcomers to participate fully, fully in our society, they do have to know what the rules of society actually are. Unfortunately, we tend to turn those rules into a kind of cryptic crossword puzzle. We resist being too explicit or prescriptive about what being British actually means. And let me give you an example. I was recently invited to what was described as, um, as a small informal supper at uh, one of the government's uh, stately homes, one that will be familiar to Charles from his time in Cabinet. Very nice, very flattering. Um, now, in this context, small means 24 people. I don't know what your dinner parties are like, but that's <laughs> a lot of people. But informal actually meant an invitation on a stiff card. And the model card, it says, no dress code. Well, it's not a problem if you're a bloke. It's informal, no dress code, you wear a suit and no tie. Now, for a woman, it's a little more complicated, I discovered. Obviously, no tiaras. But pearls or not pearls? Summer frock, business suit, trousers, skirt. Well, my partner made me bring up some people who'd been before to get a steer on the rules. And their guidance was absolutely uniformly vague. In the end, she wore an outfit in which she felt comfortable, and of course, being a woman of taste and discernment, she got it completely right. But the point of the story is it taught me a lesson about our country. It is that in this game of managing our difference, the apparent ease and flexibility of the British way can be a two-edged sword. When someone says, no dress code, the problem is, what it really means is that if you don't already know what the code <laughs> is, are you really sure you belong here? <laughs> A more serious problem in this arena of culture and manners is the issue of offence. There are many people who now think that we should be more active in policing what people say. I'll be direct, I disagree. We cannot and should not censor speech. One reason is this path is always oppressive, particularly towards minorities, even if it is started in their defence. And it usually ends up making the state look foolish. Example. In Christmas 2011, I had to ring the controller of BBC Radio 1 to tell him that he did not need to excise a line from the late Kirsty McCall uh, and Shane McGowan song, Fairy Tale of New York. And those of you who know the song will know what's coming. It's a dialogue between two despairing lovers for whom the promise of the city has turned into a drink-sodden nightmare. They row, and she attacks him with these words. You're a drunk, you're a faggot, you're a cheap, lousy maggot. Radio 1 bleeped the word faggot. Well, offensive, yeah. Gratuitous, no. It perfectly expresses the rage and frustration that this woman feels. Should we be in the business of telling artists that they can't express that rage? I don't think so. 
we wouldn't be any better than the old Soviet Union or the present China. A fence is a part of the reality of a diverse society. It need not make us unequal. So there are issues of culture and manners in our two different box to sort out. Second area, institutional inertia, most vividly expressed at the moment in the public agonies of the Church of England in trying to reconcile its place as a state church with the right to define marriage. With, on the one hand, uh, with, the, with its role as the leader of a diverse worldwide communion. Another set of institutions facing the same, similar problem, politics. Some parties are now faced with demographic change that, may, that threatens to make them unelectable. Mitt Romney might now be the President of the United States had he not surrendered three quarters of the Hispanic vote to President Obama. Things are going to get worse for the Republican Party as that particular demographic increases in size. But it's worth noting, however, that this cuts both ways. The President won amongst American women as a group, but only because minority women tipped in his direction by margins of, of more than 70 or 80 percent. He lost amongst white women, and he uh, attracted, uh, I think, the second lowest vote of any Democrat amongst white Americans. Now, that describes a society which is far from united. Recent work for the Conservative Party here suggests that unless they can rewrite the narrative held by minority voters, voters including those who on every other indi indicator would certainly be Tory voters, they can say goodbye to parliamentary majority in 2015. Now, I don't have to tell you what my view about the politics of, of this are. But I will say what is even more important to me is that I do not want to live in a democracy where the electorate is in effect colour coded. I know where that leads. I talked to you already <coughs> about the countries my family comes from. The third area that I think we need to uh, address is possibly the most different, difficult. And this is the area of inherent differences between identity groups. It is perhaps why the equal but different compartment remains closed, because these are sensitive issues which most people want to avoid. And I want to give you some examples of why we find it hard to discuss these issues of inherent difference. Let me start with education. It's clear that in this country standards of achievement at 16 GCSE level are rising. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, David Blunkett. And actually, perhaps, to some extent, thank you, Michael Gove. For over a decade, we've monitored the numbers. We've learned that different ethnic groups perform differently, but that they can all improve. For example, African-Caribbean boys who used to trail a pack are catching up. Poor white boys who are becoming the back markers will probably catch up again, too. However, the data confronts us with an extremely uncomfortable and consistent single finding, which I'm going to tell you about, which, by the way, is echoed in the internationally. In most ethnic groups, there is 20, a 20% 20 gap between the performance of the poor and the average student. There is one exception to this rule, and that exception, children of Chinese heritage, where the poor-not-poor poor gap is just 2%. And in practice, it doesn't matter very much anyway, because poor Chinese children, 90% of whom get through the five good GCSE uh, threshold, beat the pants off every other demographic uh, group, irrespective of their class. Now, what's the hard question here? Well, the hard question is this. What have they got that the rest of us don't? And if we could copy it, should we? Or should we, as we would have done in the past, register this as a kind of unjust inequality <coughs> with the, uh, the following consequence that we should consider, if we care about equality, some kind of reverse discrimination. 
Second example, one of the single most consistent causes of the gender pay gap, as I said earlier on, is job segregation. Women have been less likely to do maths at uh, university in the past. They're still less likely to do engineering at university by a factor of many. That's perhaps why they have gravitate, gravitated to retail or media. But we want more women in engineering, and they should want to be where careers are more secure and salaries higher. Well, we can fix that by offering incentives. But research published yesterday by a, firm, uh, a, a company called Universum about the choice of male and female graduates, based on data from 60,000 graduates internationally, shows that even female engineers prefer to work in the so-called FM uh, CG sector, fast-moving consumer goods. One of the favourite firms amongst women engineers is L'Oreal. They see this as a more family-friendly, uh, uh, more woman-friendly uh, organisation. Men, on the other hand, are drawn to the competitiveness and rewards of banking in spite of recent history. Third example. Today, parents have greater choice over the schools that their children attend in England and Wales than they used to. It's a good thing. But work from Bristol University has shown that over the past 10 years, parents' preference for schools with more children who are similar to their own has led uh, to uh, a situation where in England and Wales, most schools are more ethnically segregated than the communities in which they sit. The exception, by the way, are faith schools, particularly Catholic and uh, Church of England schools, which draw from wider catchment areas. Now, the people who make these choices are not bigots. This is not white flight. But it does mean that our schools are changing in character, in a way, in the opposite direction to the way that we would like them to change. In some cities today, most minority children sit in classes where there are hardly any children who do not share their ethnicity. Experience in the United States, where laws have been in place for half a century to deter segregation, shows that their schools have experienced the same phenomenon. Uh, in addition to the sheer fact of dividing children by race, they tell us that there's clear evidence that it leads to very different qualities of education. Well, we can't and shouldn't restrict choice, so how do we encourage a shared future? Finally, a thought experiment. When the men lined up for the 100 metres at last year's Olympics, we all knew who was going to win, and he did. But what was remarkable was that every one of the men alongside Usain Bolt wasn't just black. They were all descendants of West Africans, like me. And they were all from families who had, at some point, been slaves, not like mine. Now, there are all sorts of hypotheses about this, twitch fights and all that. I'm not going to go into that. Go into that. I'll simply note that whatever it is that guys like me have, it makes us proportionately more likely to win that race than most of you. <laughs> and it's been that way pretty much consistently since Jesse Owens competed in Berlin in 1936. Same is true about the East and North Africans and long distances. And by the way, it's not trivial. Mr. Bolt will be worth tens of millions of dollars each year for a decade at least because of this. So he did against some poor no helper Viking from Latvia or Sweden. Is this fair? Obviously, on the odds, it's not. But will we do anything about it? I don't think so. It's going back in a too difficult box. Thank you. <laughs>